Several years ago, I became very interested with this question. If we're going to export democracy around the world, if it's going to be the job of the United States military to establish democratic governments in Afghanistan or Iraq or promote democratic transitions in Libya or in Syria, what exactly do we mean by democracy? I mean, how do we know whether or not we've been successful at transforming some foreign country into a democratic state until we really have thought about what does it mean to have a democratic government? Do we even have a democratic government? Or maybe a better question would be, how democratic is our own government if we're going to expect democracy from others? So think about that question. Consider this. How would you define or, or how would you dedicate the level of democracy in the United States at any given period in our history? At what point would you say that we have transitioned enough to the level where you could call the United States government a democratic government or a democratic regime? For some people, they say that we were a democracy at 1776. They define democracy as some form of creation of self-representation self or or in some sense that you have created your own national destiny. And so the moment we created our own country, some would say that we're a democratic. But the thing is, in 1776, very few people actually had the ability to participate in elections. Only a few percentage points of the American population was actually involved in the selection of our first round of democratically elected representatives in 1792. So some would push back the date of democracy a little bit further into about 1880. 1880 is the first presidential election that would occur after the end of Reconstruction. We had had a civil war, slaves had been liberated, blacks had been given the right to vote, and the southern states were no longer being occupied by the United States military. Is that when, when we're a democracy, when slavery no longer exists? But the thing is, even after slavery ended and blacks were given the right to vote, it wasn't until 1920 that all women in the United States were allowed to vote, and women make up more than half of the American population. But further still forward into the future, when you consider what does it mean for a person not only to have the right to vote, but also to have access to the ability to vote, and how many African Americans were continued to be denied the right to vote in Southern states uh, up until the passage of the Civil Rights Acts and the Voting, Voting Rights Acts of the 1960s. Further still into the future, we have to consider whether or not we're a democracy when the most important position in our government can be elected in opposition to a will of the American people. As recently as 2016, but earlier in 2000, a presidential candidate won the presidency despite the fact that they lost the nationwide popular vote. Does that make us a democracy? In some ways, maybe it does, because the rule of law won out. But still, are you a democracy if the people ultimately aren't the ones in charge? Now, to understand that, I, I want to take a step back and talk about what democracy meant in the classical sense, or perhaps more appropriately, uh, this debate that was created, this discussion that was created when we were ratifying the American Constitution. Um, this argument that democracy is somehow different from a Republican form of government, and therefore democracy is something that should be not preferred if you're creating a Madisonian style constitution, which the American Constitution essentially is. Now in this debate, uh, the, the argument is that democracy is a Greek model of government that was basically based on mob rule. But in reality, in the democratic governments of the Greek states, very few citizens were able to participate in the political system. Only landed uh, citizens could actually vote. And when they did vote, there were very few things that they could actually vote on. It turns out that most of the important decisions were still going to be made by elected leaders. Republic, on the other hand, is a Latin concept. It's a Roman concept. And in that concept, there were almost no powers given directly to the people almost all were handled by elected leaders. But in that sense, just like in Greece, most of the power was in the hands of those leaders. Very little real power was in the hands of the average person in either political system. And very few people actually participated in politics under the Roman model. And so in some sense, this classical notion of democracy or republic doesn't really 
hold up to the modern definition, the way that we think of democracy today. Today, when we talk about democracy, we're talking about a system where power ultimately rests with the people. We're thinking about popular consent or popular control of the political system. Now, there are degrees to which a state can be powerful or the people of that state can be powerful. Um, in some places, there are popular referendums or the power to recall or the ability to, to amend the constitution by popular vote. But in others, uh, such as the American constitution, the individual citizen has very few direct accesses to the levers of power and almost all power is controlled by election of delegates or election of representatives. But still, because ultimately power rests with the people, we would consider those to be democratic governments. What we also have to consider is that democracy is not just simply the political characteristics of a state, but under this modern conception, we also think of it as being uh, a, a set of social characteristics, that there's some qualities to the nature of society and to how we treat others in society, people who are different to us, that also helps determine whether or not we're democratic. Now, in this particular lecture, I want to focus on the political characteristics. And perhaps specifically, I want to talk about part of the reason why it may be impossible to have a perfectly democratic state, not only because it might not be possible for the people to make all the decisions, but because when we think about what it means to be a democracy in the modern sense, you can't have all of the characteristics of democracy equally. So for example, one of the characteristics of democracy, one of the things that we think is important to all democratic states is this concept of liberty, this idea of freedom. We call it liberal democracy. And with liberty or liberal democracy, we're just simply referring to the idea that the individual citizen, the individual member of society has certain basic rights and the government cannot take those basic rights away. In the American Constitution, our system talks about the First Amendment or the Second Amendment as being the keeper of many of those political rights, as well as other amendments where we hold our protections from the government for criminal defendants. But we're talking about things like the right to life, liberty. We're talking about the freedom of speech. We're talking about the freedom of press. We're talking about the freedom to own property, the right to keep and bear arms, freedoms of religion, freedoms of petition. All these are examples where we currently argue that the government cannot overstep certain bounds when trying to take power away from the people. But that's not the only way of thinking about democracy. Another characteristic of democracy is what we call substantive democracy, or perhaps more appropriately, equality. These have become uh, known as civil rights in the modern vernacular. And, and substantive equality, substantive democracy, is just simply the idea that all individuals in society are ultimately treated and created equally that all members of society had the same access to government, the same access to political power, that all members of society are treated fairly by the state. And if you have the government playing favorites, treating one group better than others, either because of their race or their religion or, or because of their socioeconomic status, then you have to question the democratic character of a political system. When you're thinking about this debate over when did we become a democracy, this is the reason why some people would argue that America wasn't really fully democratic until 1880 or maybe not even later, until 1968. How can you say that you're a fully democratic country when you have segregation, for example, or a denial of the right to vote to African Americans or to women? It's difficult to say that we were fully democratic when those uh, forms of inequality were allowed to continue. Now, a third way of thinking about, or a third characteristic of democracy is this idea of rule of law. And by rule of law, we're simply talking about the fact that outcomes are made not because of public passions, outcomes are made not simply because of the whims of elected leaders, but rather there's a process, there are a set of rules, and those rules have to be followed. It's the fact that you could have something like the electoral college determine the outcome of an election, where the rules say who the winner is, even if the winner may not be the person that everyone prefers, that we might argue our country is more democratic than we give it credit for. We tend to follow the rules in the United States and countries that follow the rules uh, have the ability to have democratic governments. And then finally, there's the notion of popular control, the more traditional understanding of what it means to be democratic. But even with popular control, there are a series of procedures that have to be in place. 
you have to have a way of conducting elections. Those elections have to be free and fair. They shouldn't be manipulated by the partisans or by the, by the leadership on either side. When a person casts their vote, they need to have certainty that that vote is going to actually count the way that it's intended to be cast. And the more popular control, the more often you get to vote, the more members you get to vote for, for your government, or the more uh, decisions you get to make, the more democratic that we could argue that a political system is. Now, I mentioned that there are some contradictions between the four, these four, and I'm going to let you sort of think about these on your own time, and we'll talk about these contradictions a little bit more in a later video. But for now, answer these couple of questions for yourself. First of all, if we decide that we want equality, if we decide that we want increased political equality, and we recognize that on some level political equality is a function of economic equality, if we decide that everyone in our society should have equal access to education, for example, that where you live or your gender or your race shouldn't determine whether or not you get to go to a good school, who pays for all of that? How do we create opportunity, access for everyone, when some people have more wealth than others? Wouldn't we have to deny one group of people their liberty, their control over their property, to help pay for the equality of another group of people, especially if we start from a position of social hierarchy? Another way that we can think about these contradictions and political characteristics is to ask, is it illiberal? In other words, is it a violation of a person's liberty to be forced to associate with someone who you believe behaves immorally or to participate in acts or actions that you deem immoral? And this has been a pretty big question in the United States in the last 15 years. Can I force a business to provide a cake, for example, for a wedding for a gay marriage if the business owner is an evangelical Christian who opposes gay marriage? Can you force businesses like Hobby Lobby to sell uh, drugs or other forms of birth control to, to provide rather drugs or other forms of birth control to their employees when the owners of Hobby Lobby, the people who are paying for that insurance, believe that birth control is immoral or should not be allowed? Are we taking away their liberal freedoms so that other people might have greater substantive equality. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, and if so, I hope that you check out a couple of the other videos in this series. Uh, and if you are interested, we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you.